this sort of the magical object in Venko is something that is incredibly mundane. It's a souvenir spoon. It's not a wand. It's not uh, something of great value. It is something so mundane. It's from souvenir culture, which is, you know, things we don't give much thought to. But this is the thing because it should represent that all of us have the capacity to connect to something extraordinary. I'm Michael Tam, CEO of Rakuten Kobo. This is Kobo in Conversation. My guest today is novelist Cherie Dimoline, author of the 2017 YA science fiction novel, The Marrow Thieves, and its sequel, Hunting by Stars, the novel Empire of the Wild. She has won prizes and awards aplenty, and her new book is Zenko, a work of speculative fiction in which a secretive corporation named Venko hires a powerful witch to assemble an elite coven before the recruits are found by an ancient witch hunter. Cherie Demeline, welcome to Kobo. Wow, thank you so much, Michael. I'm happy to be here. This book has an absolutely badass opening scene. We have <laughs> black cars rolling into an office building three women of obviously tremendous power rolling up to their headquarters, and they are the mythic triumvirate, the maiden, the mother, and the crone, just like coming out of limos, coming together for a meeting of Benko, their mysterious corporation. How do you describe Venko? So Venko to me, uh, well, Venko in the book is, is really about uh, an organization that puts femmes, female identified people, people who hold feminine knowledge into positions of power. So we have, um, you know, uh, senators and lawmakers, we have powerful corporate lawyers, we have uh, uh, captains of industry that are going to sort of, you know, move their companies forward or bury them if they see fit. It's about uh, these women um, organizing and pulling in the best minds with, with all of this diverse knowledge from all corners of the globe to infiltrate the capitalist system uh, and, and find ways to maneuver and manipulate it. And the, our, our um, sort of three women that, that show up, that run the show, the, the Mother Maiden and the Crown, are the Coven Engagement Oracle, which of course would make them the CEO uh, of Venco. And so they're kind of overseeing all of, the, all of this action uh, and moving the plan forward. Um, and I really wanted to uh, start off, you know, kind of subvert or flip that, the expectation of, you know, witches as these kind of crunchy granola forest dwelling uh, hippies and have these like really badass, powerful, sexual, present, brilliant women um, in, you know, kind of sliding into this glass tower in, uh, in LA, as it were. In the series that launched your career, The Marrow Thieves, the protagonists did not get gleaming offices or chauffeurs. We had isolated bands of survivors trying to fight their way through a hostile world. They're hiding in the woods. They're living in tarps and tents and trees. This is different. These people had power and influence. Why it was it after writing books with people fighting against impossible odds? Was it interesting to even up the scales a bit? Yeah, I think. Well, I think the the characters in in uh, you know a book like The Marrow Thieves had incredible power, but it, they were fighting against an overwhelming system. Um, and so I think you know Venko is 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 similar that these are characters who have incredible power and are fighting an overwhelming system, but it's a different. Uh, more, more overarching kind of evil. Um, I guess it's it's more, uh, it, and I don't know if this is the right term, but kind of a mainstream or a known uh, evil that actually has, you know, very specific um, um, sort of relatable uh, systematic issues that come out of okay. it. So we're talking about the patriarchy, but we're talking about colonization and we're talking about capitalism and we're, you know, talking about the struggle for equality. Um and, and in a lot of ways, you know, the the characters are are on equal footing 
uh, in terms of trying to survive a system that they didn't create and one that wants nothing more uh, than to put them down uh, and to relegate them to, to these margins where they can be controlled. But I will say it was really fun um, to also have characters that had the space in the narrative to experience and transmit joy. I love the fact that we're moving into this time when you know we're, we're telling stories of survival, but we're also telling our stories of joy, right? As, as survivors, as people who are thriving, you know? Um, in the indigenous community, we have so many incredible writers who are doing that work of taking on uh, you know, difficult issues and, and talking about um, history, but also talking about and living that capacity for joy. You know, people like Ariel Twist and Jay Simpson and uh, uh, Billy Ray Belcourt and Joshua Whitehead, just these writers who are you know, not shying away from, from the difficulty, but also delving into the sheer joy uh, of, of Indigenous life. Well, and it's it's funny you mention that because we we had Billy Ray Belcourt on on Kobo in conversation and spent a lot of time talking about that need to to both express joy and to capture joy. So, Michael, did Billy Ray? Whenever I do anything with um, uh, Billy Ray, I'm I'm I really feel very old and stupid <laughs> <laughs> because Billy Ray Belcourt is like the smartest kid on the block, smartest person who also happens to be incredibly young. I love him to death, but man, when I have conversations with him, I'm always like, I should read more or like go back to school. Or just be smarter. Or just be smarter. <laughs> All of the setup happens just in the prologue. And prologues are funny things because they bring a reader into the world of the story, but then they're set apart from the flow of chapters that follow. This story is shaped by those three women and then co, but it's really about our main character, Lucky. Can you introduce us to her? Yeah. So, so Lucky St. James, she's uh, stuck. She's frustrated with her life. Um, she's, you know, in, in her late twenties, she lives in, in Toronto in the East end, uh, where, where I spent a lot of years living. Um, and she is, uh, she lives with her, her grandmother. She was, uh, orphaned. Um, her mother passed away when she was about 10, her, her father, uh, she lost to addictions. Um, and so she lives with her grandmother in this one bedroom apartment, uh, where she sleeps in the attic. And her grandmother, Stella, is becoming increasingly, you know, more forgetful and Lucky's having to give her, you know, more care. She, you know, kind of wanders off or tells ridiculous stories or what she seem, sees as ridiculous stories. Um, and so Lucky wants to write. She wants to be a writer. But that, we know, takes, you know, it, it's taking a chance. It's, it's a risk. Um, and so she has this regular temp job that she keeps because she's got to pay the bills. Uh, her mother was a bit of a amazing wild card and so she wants stability now she you know doesn't want um uncertainty so she just nine to five is slogging along um and then one day uh she finds a little silver spoon and she's recruited into a salem coven and the world is different there are groups out there she had no idea uh you know book clubs and neighborhood watch groups are not what she thought they were um, and the, the coven has has a mission and they need to pull together uh, the seven witches that are supposed to be a part of this coven. And Lucky is number six. And so it will be her job to go out and find the final witch. But this is Lucky we're talking about, right? I mean, she's like, you know, hanging out on the Danforth and like has a crappy temp job. And um, she has had no idea that this world exists. So that's kind of where we find her. And there's a timeline. Like she does not have much time to get this done. 17 days to pull her, her shit together and then pull this, this circle together. This is a story about witches. Witches are everywhere. There are lineages of witches. Venko is recruiting witches. Witches are working together to try to find each other. What do what do witches mean to you? It is true. Witches, witches are everywhere in this story and witches are everywhere in the global story. Witches have um, existed in one form or another or been recorded or, you know, had, had stories told about them um, in, in, you know, almost every country uh, around the world through all 
periods of time. Um, and we know that uh, witches often held space for um, narratives that we couldn't tell. They, they sort of were placeholders for queer stories when we weren't allowed to tell those stories. They were placeholders for um, people from different communities, uh, for anyone who's, who was considered an outsider from this sort of ex acceptable mainstream. Um, and so they became uh, an important archetype for a lot of reasons. And I thought, well, I want to tell my own story, but I, I also want to keep that archetype. I want to talk about the freedom and restrictions of, of what, what we think and what we know about witches. Um, so then I, I, I started uh, researching and um, fell down a lot of rabbit holes. <laughs> so, you know, I, I was looking at you know, the Gardinian Wiccans. So this is like, you know, the whole Wicca movement, which was actually started in the 50s by, you know, an old dude in Britain. Um, things like the Order of the Golden Dawn, uh, Thelema, you know, Hoodoo, Voodoo, um, Pennsylvania Powwow, Appalachian Granny Women, um, the, the fairy uh, witch movements. All of these um, systems of belief or, or communities uh, operating in North America. And in the, in the case of a lot of streams of um, uh, sort of witchcraft or, or, you know, folk magic, they really uh, took root in North America. And I thought, how interesting that there's all this folk magic and different beliefs out there still in existence uh, happening across North America uh, on Indigenous land. Um, and what are the ways in which um, though all of these belief systems sort of weave together, what are the ways in which they overlap or kind of even butt up against one another? Um, and so I, you know, I, I found myself uh, reading everything, uh, looking at you know modern works of witchcraft, reading contemporary uh, novels about witches, um, looking at academic studies, um, you know, all the way back to you know the early texts that were coming out that really were uh, one of the ways that the printing press was put into common usage was to produce these books and pamphlets uh, against witches and, you know, moving into the Inquisition. So, so pulling up all of those texts and looking at it and really it's, um, I mean, it's, there's so many uh, uh, different systems and there's, there's so many different ways in which it was used against uh, uh, women or gender non-conforming people. Um, um, and it, and it just fascinated me that this is a, a, a space, uh, of struggle, but it's also a, a, a space of incredible power, um, of not needing an intermediary, not needing a priest to sort of deliver your message or not needing a specific place you have to go to, to meet with your deity. It was, you know, literally in your blood and it was in your backyard and it was in your, at your kitchen table. Um, and it was really about defying a system that would, you know, commoditize our time and, and, and our efforts and make it necessary for us to have to rely on other people. Um, so it was just, it was fascinating. So I think it started off as, you know, just a general love of these, like, uh, these witches that were, were rebels in, in popular culture and then really turned into me doing this, this very nuanced deep dive um, and coming back thinking, Wow, there's so many stories here. I was immediately all in on Lucky, you know, discovering what was her role going to be, what was her destiny, what was her power. And at the same time, this is a familiar theme for those of us who read and love fiction that leans towards fantasy. You know, that story of you didn't know you had magic in you, but now you do. Or mm -hmm. you didn't know you were special, but you are. Is is well traveled ground in fantasy and in YA specifically because we all somewhere deep down want to receive that message. The reality is is that all of us uh, have that letter slipped under our, our door, or we can. The the all of us have have this incredible inherent uh, connection to to what you know we call magic right we we all at some point should look out the window and think Th this can't be it like there is something the world is not just this way the world is this way because someone made it this way there are other ways there are other other layers out there um and i'm not even you know saying that you have to be a, a believer in a certain um you know set of beliefs or you know that you 
have, you know, I talk to people and they're like, are you a witch? And I'm like, I don't know. I maybe, <laughs> you know, there, there doesn't have to be a commitment to a sort of uh, uh, system or, or community, but it's just the fact that um, we are here, right? We, we understand now that, you know, there's remnants of, of past stars that, you know, is in our blood. That's not metaphysical, that's science, right? It's, we understand that there is a natural connection. And so I think for me, it was about trying to remind people, um, you know, that there is this great amnesia that's that's come over us. We 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 live in this capitalist society. We we have jobs, of course. You know, we we have s- structures and systems put in place, and that's all well and good. But that there is more. Of course, there is more, and it's easy to be blindsided by by the immediacy of the world. Um, but that there are ways to connect. We don't uh, need someone to help connect us to the ground and to the sky. We are already there. And I think the pandemic, um, what I was seeing was a lot of people feeling, you know, very alone. Of course, it was hard to be in community when you physically couldn't be near people and we had to find new ways to communicate. Um, but, you know, people felt very adrift because the, the you know, the world had kind of shut down. Um, but also the world, you know, was kind of remembering that there is something outside the city and there is something uh, that we can do. And I think the ways in which I wanted to play with it was this thing that I always say that is very important to me in all of my work is that the extraordinary is inside of the ordinary. One cannot exist without the other. And that's why um, this sort of object of the magical object uh, in Venco is something that is incredibly mundane. It's a it's a souvenir spoon. It's not a wand. It's not uh, something of great value. It is something so mon- mundane. It's from souvenir culture, which is, you know, things we don't give much thought to, but that there, you know, this is the the thing because it should represent that all of us um, have the capacity to connect to something extraordinary. That idea of the extraordinary inside the ordinary is is something that i that really resonated for me in, in this book because i love how so much of lucky's journey is just about dealing with practical stuff for all that you know she's a witch and she has a you know, she has a mission that she has to perform but it's not like her day-to-day obligations go away she has elder care issues you have grandmother to take care of she has to cross borders and find hotels and like it's not <laughs> like someone's just putting her on a magic train and you know sends her off like she's she's got shit to deal with I, it's that's yes michael i one of the things that i when i'm watching something that pulls me out of a story or when i'm reading something is is the moment where everything changes and suddenly they don't have to pay rent or like nobody has to like let the dog out in in you know at lunchtime and it and it sort of pulls me out because I'm like as much as I want to believe in this fantasy and as much as I'm saying you know there's there's something else out there and there is a connection we still do live uh, in this world and it's great to think that you know let's have a character that has to deal with all that that we all have to deal with but who also can it can accomplish something else. No, oh, it, it keeps coming up. It's like I gave up my apartment to do this. Yeah. <laughs> It's a big deal. Yep. Especially in Toronto. And especially because the apartment is also where her grandmother, Stella, lives. So can we talk a little bit about Stella? Because I love her and I think she's the absolute best. So uh, we actually meet her at peak Stellaness, which is uh, Lucky shows up uh, back home uh, one night after having a couple drinks, just sort of lamenting uh, her existence on a Wednesday night. And uh, Stella is, you know, simultaneously watching an, an old movie on TV with the volume really loud, uh, you know, has the music, has the stereo cranked up to like 10. She's, you know, has a bunch of, you know, Reader's Digest magazines all around her. Um, she, the fire alarm is going off because she's put popcorn in the microwave and forgotten about it. Um, so Lucky has sort of bursts into the apartment and there's, you know, smoke and the alarms going off and there's like a small fire in the microwave and Stella's like, what the hell's your problem? So we meet Stella as somebody who, um, you know, is, is a bit forgetful. She's, she's 77. Um, she's, uh, Stella's, she's Lucky's father's uh, mother. So it's her paternal grandmother. Um, and she is widowed 
and she has lived in this this uh, apartment, which is you know the top floor of a converted Victorian since she was first married. Um, and she likes to tell lucky stories, their, their memories. And as they sort of come to her, she vocalizes them. And the thing that I love about Stella, and we see this more as we move through the story is, um, you know, lucky loves her truly, but also, you know, has, there's a bit of an edge to it because she is, is Stella's caretaker. And she feels like Stella is one of the reasons why she can't, you know, take a risk on her writing and she can't um, go out into the world and explore. But really we start to see that, you know, Lucky may be using Stella as an excuse to not have to try. Um, and Stella, you know, my favorite characters um, do this. They have no shame. Uh, and Stella will do, you know, kooky shit and make mistakes and, and, you know, sort of go her own way and, you know, you sing a song in the in the middle of the afternoon and makes no apologies about it. Uh, and I really love that. She's she she is one of the characters that um, I, I meant to be smaller. And then as soon as she was kind of drafted out, um, she did as she does. And she just kind of uh, pushed her way into into a lot more of the story than I thought she was going to be in. And I'm really grateful because I, I you know, it she is that connection to. Um, the knowledge that that the everyday knowledge that we think isn't going to change our lives or change the world, but in, in actuality is exactly the materials we need for the architecture of change. That's what Stella represents. And so she's underestimated from day one. She's you know fun to read. She has a, a, a lot of knowledge um, and she becomes increasingly important as uh, Lucky is, is forced to drag her along on this epic road trip because she feels like she can't leave Stella alone because she might wander off or get into trouble. And what, what I love about her is that she encapsulates you know, all of the contradictions that, um, that older people embody in our lives. Yeah, when, we're, you know, when we're trying to be important, we talk about our elders and the power and the wisdom that they represent. But she also has, you know, embodied within that, you know, how we discount the older people in our lives or get annoyed by them or frustrated by them while we love them at the same time. Mm -hmm. So was she a way of being able to talk about that, that larger and more complicated theme of older an elder or was as you said just was she a character that just kind of grabbed a hold of her piece of the page and kept going <laughs> she she was both she she was she was the character that you know sort of just dug in um uh and thank god she did because you know she, um it really changed the the story in, in profound ways i think um but as i you know uh as the story was moving ahead i i really thought th th this is an opportunity um to talk about how older people are uh, become invisible. Um, and so Stella is, you know, right there on the page doing important things um, and Lucky can't see it. And sometimes we as the readers uh, read her a certain way and don't see it. The same way that, you know, a lot of the women in power, like, you know, uh, uh, Mina Good and, and Wendy Coenzi, who, who, you know, are leading the Salem um, uh, coven kind of a, you know, a power couple um, are, you know, in their, in their fifties. Like it's, these are women who are gorgeous and brilliant and, and, and sexual. And, and we often don't get the opportunity to see that. Um, and I, and I think, you know, what a shame there's, there's such a power uh, in a, in an older person who, who has, has experience and, and who holds knowledge and really, um, the older years are a time of incredible generosity in my experience, you know, and, and yes, it, it, it sometimes is a little cumbersome to, to navigate. There's a lot of uh, issues that comes with age, but, but it's a time of generosity. It's people who have a lifetime of experience and stories um, that they want to give before they, they move on to whatever's next. And so I, I wanted to, um, really kind of put in a reminder like you know the, these are these are personalities and people and knowledge holders that sometimes are pushed to the margin and and we don't listen 
And and what I mean, shame on us. That that's and also, what are the opportunities that we're missing? Right? I mean, we talk about. I mean, people often ask me. They're like, okay, well, if this book is saying capitalism and you know the patriarchy doesn't work, what would you do to replace it? Well, I, you know, I sure as hell don't know, but I do know that in order to be able to figure out what we could do next, we need to have different people at the table having that conversation. Um, and so, you know, older women you know, like Stella, became absolutely essential to coming up with those answers. As a reader, I loved speculative fiction that takes big swings. And as somebody whose day job is taking care of a business, you know, I was fascinated by peeking around how other companies and organizations work and how they make decisions, how they get stuff done, all of that. And I love books that have a world behind the world, like a hidden structure that only some people can see. So this checked all of my favorite boxes. And so I was wondering what kind of world builder are you? You know, are there you know, maps and diagrams? And do you spend a lot of time mapping out what this place and who these people and what this culture is that may never end up on the page? Or do you figure it out as you go? <laughs> oh man, I, I have a lot of, I, I'm really fortunate in that I have a, a lot of incredible writer friends. Um, and one of them that I, who I always talk about uh, when I'm asked this question is Eden Robinson. So Eden Robinson, who we all know is just a brilliant, you know, standalone, standout uh, world builder. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh my God. It has first of all, you know, works in a tidy space and has um, calendars with like the dates mapped out for her story. Like if this character did this on Wednesday, that would mean, you know, this is when it would have to be initiated, you know, has outlines, things are color coded. I mean, I've seen the photos and it's actually quite nauseating and remarkable. And um, that is not my friend, how this stuff happens on my end as much as I'm, you know, envious of it. Um, I kind of get an idea, become incredibly emotionally involved, fall into the whole of the story and then try and write my way out. That's usually, it's either draft one or it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's me writing a messy outline, which is a lie mm -hmm. that I just said, because I don't write outlines. God, I keep trying to give myself more credit. <laughs> yeah. It's a mess, Michael. It's, um, and my, my office will attest to this. I have piles and piles of books, um, you know, and, and random things, artifacts and vintage things that, that, you know, inspire a part of the story, lots of imagery, uh, everywhere kind of taped up that, that, you know, encapsulates a feeling that I want to make sure I put into the story. Um, so it's, it's kind of a big, it's a big mess. Um, and then there's the research. So again, I kind of, you know, there's the characters and I know the story and I feel very emotional about it. And then I have to go in, even though it's fiction, right? I have to go in and do the research. Um, so for this, like I said, it, this, this, this book was, was truly insane in the amount of, you know, texts and, and the conversations I had, but man, was it fun. Like I got to talk to witches and like, you know, read all this old, all these old books and like pamphlets about witches. And, you know, I've been to all of, uh, all of the places that, you know, there's, there's a road trip through the book. And so that's a trip that I've taken. Um, and so it was incredibly fun, but it really is just uh, kind of me inside this dense story, um, trying to find a way out, trying, which means then leaving a way in for the readers. So for me, it's a, it's about, it's about trying to create, trying to curate um, um, a collection of feelings so that I can really take the reader inside of it. That's what's really important. So from a process perspective, it's kind of writing as avalanche rescue. <laughs> it's all on top of you and you're digging your way out. But you, listen, you need to know that this is giving hope and solace to all of the chaotic thinkers out there who don't color code things and don't have, you know, like <laughs> filing systems and tabs and everything else. And this is really important for us to hear. We need to, you know, we need to know this. <laughs> On that idea, I'm interested in how the work of a writer changes as they progress through their career. Like what, what you learn as you work on each new book, 
what gets easier and what gets harder? Oh, wow. Well, I'm, I'm going to say something that's kind of very, uh, you know, practical, but I, I think it needs to be said is that uh, I, I'm in a place of great privilege because I've been able to uh, secure publishing contracts and that is life changing for an author. Um, I often tell this story, all I ever wanted to be my entire life, um, because I grew up with these you know, brilliant storytellers, when I understood that a, a book was just a home where a story lived, um, that's what I want it to be. From the time I was five, I said, you know, I'm going to build homes. I'm going to be a house builder for, to, you know, to give these stories a place to live. Um, and so that's, it's a lifetime of work. Um, and, and, you know, I struggled and had some uh, pretty crappy early experiences. I mean, what, you know, I had the great experience of working with um, some indigenous publishers, but, you know, we know that work is, is, is hard. There's, there's a lack of resources. And so, um, you do your best. Um, I had so, some not so great early experiences with, you know, work that was supposed to be, uh, you know, make a lot of good change. Um, and, and you just keep going. Like, I remember being a single mom. I, I was a, a, a teenage mom. Um, and I remember, you know, living in Toronto and I couldn't afford to put my son um, in, in daycare while I went to school and work. Uh, anywhere near where I lived. So we'd have to take the bus. And so we were on the bus and it was late. So he's already sleeping in my arms because, you know, that's how long it takes to get through our day. And we used to pass by on Eglinton, the old Penguin Random House office. And every day we'd, we'd drive by and I'd be sitting there in the bus and I'd think one day, one day I'm going to walk into that building and they're going to listen to me. And the day that I stood outside the Penguin Random House building to have my meeting to sign my contract, I had to take a minute uh, and really remember that, remember that feeling um, and hold on to it and never forget that it takes a lot of struggle and that there are writers out there everywhere right now. There are people who have stories that we need to hear, that they need to tell. And it is such a struggle because we live in this world where, you know, we have to make sacrifices and, and there's not, you know, there's not opportunities in every single corner and we have to go down the alleyways and, you know, scrounge around and try and find them or make them. Um, so that's what's significantly changed for me in my writing is having a contract, ha knowing that when I produce a work that there will be editors who will absolutely look at it has given me such an ease um, so that I'm able to really delve into the stories that I want to tell. Um, so I, I just I, I just needed to say that because I, I know, you know, we talk about as writers like this, the whole process and the struggle, like in terms of, you know, what we can tell and how we tell it. But the first step is really just the security of knowing that someone is going to be there to accept our stories. It frees up so much of our, our creativity and, and what we end up producing. And you explain to our listeners what a writer gets from working with an editor who is both well-resourced and skilled. Absolutely. Um, they get um, absolute anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> and then absolute joy. <laughs> well, I can see why people would want that. That sounds great. Yes. When I was, I, I was kind of, I had this very surreal experience. Um, so things sort of changed, you know, after the Marrow Thieves. Um, I'd been searching for a long time for, you know, it, it, the Marrow Thieves was not my first book. Um, and so I'd been searching for a long time for an agent. And I mean, you know, finding an agent is next to impossible. Um, there's, there's, you know, not enough agents, so many writers and, and, you know, you, it's a very complex dynamic and it also has to be a good fit. Um, but I couldn't get anyone to even return my calls. Um, and then the Marrow Thieves in one week, uh, sort of won the governor general's award. And then the day after the Kirkus prize in the States, and then every agent in the universe suddenly found my number, which was an interesting experience. Um, and so then, so, you know, truly it was a, an absolute a complete pivot in my life. And then, so I had the, you know, luxury of, you know, looking at different agencies and uh, going, finding uh, my, my dream fit at Cook McDermott. And then this very strange thing happened where suddenly all these, you know, large publishers wanted to meet with me. And so I was going into these meetings and the, you know, my, my agent, Dean Cook, who, you know, has been doing this for a long time and is brilliant said to me, 
Um, you need to really know what it is that you want, you know, before you go in, because there's going to be, you know, a lot of conversation and, and numbers and, and it's all very overwhelming and exciting. So you need to have a good sense of what it is as, as a writer, as a creator that you want. And the one thing that I really, truly knew that I needed uh, was somebody who could, because I, because I sort of write in this chaos um, and because I have all the, you know, these big ideas and because it's all very, you know, imagery and emotions that I'm trying to curate, I needed somebody who could see uh, the path forward, right? So when I started to veer off, they would pull me back onto the path. Uh, somebody who wasn't afraid um, to take that on because, you know, there's also a lot of really um, specific subjects and characters in my work that some people would feel uncomfortable stepping into, you know, well, can I, can I edit this Indigenous story or, you know, should I be giving feedback on, on this? Um, and, and so I was going into these meetings and talking and I met brilliant people. They were all brilliant. Uh -huh. I'll never forget Ann Collins uh, at Random House walking into the office and sitting down, and this was the meeting where they were sort of, you know, trying to be like, the Penguin Random House is awesome. You should come here. So, you know, it's a very courting, beautiful meeting. Uh, and, and Anne walks in and sits down and immediately starts talking to me about Empire of Wild, the manuscript that I had turned in. Um, uh -huh. And says, you know, so right from the beginning, I think what you're, you know, you're you're talking about, you need to cut through some of the text at the beginning and streamline the image and I remember the other people in the room being like, Anne, we don't have the book yet. Um, and I thought, yes, you do. You do have this book now. <laughs> what I needed was somebody, um, you know, I am from, from my community and I, I grew up there and I hold these stories. And so that's something for me to be very specific about. But what I needed was somebody who could come in and say, you know, from a different perspective and say, this isn't clear to me, maybe this isn't working. And even when we disagree, um, I know that if she's, you know, not agreeing with something that's on the page, and I really believe in it, it means I didn't do a good enough job being clear about what that piece is, what that, who that character is, right? So it's your, ed your editor, when you have a great relationship, is somebody who helps you to really make the final, you know, chisels and cuts in, in the sculpture that that is your story, that that helps you, that quite frankly, Michael, that helps you not make a fool of yourself and send out a book that is not as good as it could be. <laughs> well, speaking of storytelling, we love working with you on the uh, Kobo original audiobook version of The Marrow Thieves. It turned out so well, it made an amazing story that you could read into an amazing story that could be told to you. And you know, that gets me thinking about storytelling, about speaking stories, about speaking histories. And this is something that shows up in all of your books. Uh, is that something that just naturally works its way in? Or is it important that the act of telling stories be central to the books themselves? Yeah, it's it, so I don't know that I could tell a story without this, without that story being full of storytellers. Um, uh, I think when I was, you know, in my family, when you ask a question, you very rarely get uh, the answer that you want. That would be simple and allow you to go <laughs> on with your day. You get a story. And, and you know, and, and some of the, you know, my cousins that tell the stories, I'm like, Mm, I know this is exaggerated, but you, you know, you sort of have to take, you have to try and pick up what they're putting down and also, you know, what you need, the answer that you're trying to get. Um, so, so that, that's a very natural way of communicating for me, but it also, in all of the stories, and we see this uh, in particular in the, the Marrow Thieves, and it, it is something absolutely that is also in Benko, where the characters tell their own stories. That's something that I learned growing up, that you, I, you introduce yourself, that you identify yourself, because you are going to tell or, or share the things that make you who you are at that moment in your life when you have the opportunity to tell your own story. So, you know, who you are, I, I don't want to introduce these, you know, from an outside perspective to introduce these characters from what lucky thinks is important about say you know mina or freya it, it's about what mina or, and freya 
feel as important about them at that moment. And that's something that, you know, I put in because I think it gives you a more a greater intimacy with the, with the characters, because then you see the world from all these different perspectives, even though you're all in the same story. Um, but I also think that it's something it, that it, it's something that I would love for people to think about, um, you know, in their, in their daily lives. Um, that when you meet someone to really listen to the ways in which they're introducing themselves and what they're sharing with you, what they want you to know about them, because that's, you know, that is, that is who they are. And we all change. That is who they are at that moment, at the moment that you're meeting them. So um, stories are, are also, I think, incredibly fun. Uh, I'd always rather have a story than just sort of, um, you know, write a straight up back and forth dialogue. He said, she said, then, you know, this was, this is what happened. Just tell a story. So instead of, you know, say Mina saying to um, Lucky, listen, uh, there's these, you know, enchanted spoons that go back to 1892. Um, and, you know, that's how we find the other witches. And this is how we come together. She tells the story of finding her own spoon. Is there a difference between the act of storytelling and the act of sitting down and writing something? And, and by which I mean, you know, telling a story means that you're engaged in a connection with with a recipient, with an audience, um, as opposed to sitting down and writing where you know, those people are out there somewhere and you can't see them, you don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. Is that difference of experience something you think about as you're sitting down to to put a book together uh absolutely i think it's exactly what you said when you're when you're telling a story that's a conversation um you know and, and it's not even a, a one-sided conversation it very clearly is an exchange of energy um one of the greatest storytellers i've, I've ever met is richard van camp um, and i learned uh very early not to go on after him uh, I feel the same way about Catherine Hernandez. If you ever see Catherine Hernandez uh, tell a story, it's just if you are the poor sucker that has to hit the stage after you just go home um, because a great storyteller understands that it's a conversation, that it is a straight up exchange and they know the ways to sort of uh, uh, maneuver through that conversation that they they pull in certain threads and send out other threads and it really is beautiful I mean if if you you're in a space where somebody's telling a story with a person who's who's skilled at being a storyteller um, the the emotions in the room are heightened um, and things feel different after you have been changed. It could be in the smallest way, but now that's because what's happened is, is now that story is yours. Now that story has, has, you know, gotten into your consciousness. It might change your perspective. Uh, there might be more colors in the world. You know, there's, there's, it's quite a, a beautiful thing. So when I'm I, sitting down to write, um, it, of course, we know this, you know, um, uh, writers, we are an awkward, introspective bunch. Um, you know, it, it is it is very intimate and, and alone at the beginning. And then it becomes a conversation with your characters. Um, and this is where it kind of feels like, you know, we say those pretentious sounding things like, I don't know, this book just wrote itself. First of all, no, the book did not write itself. The characters <laughs> may have taken on a life of their own, but you worked at that and there was more than one draft. Um, but uh, but it, it is true. You have that sort of moment of conversation, like storytelling in, in concert, in a symphony with your characters. Um, and then, and, and really it's helpful to not think about who the think about the readers until later because then you start to get um worried right then with then the, okay. the real world creeps in and you're like oh my god is or is anyone gonna like this what are people gonna say oh my god is my mother gonna read this sex scene so you just have to put that aside till the end when you're doing all the honing and 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 you know fixing and making sure that everything is how you want it to be and then and then you just mark those pages for your mother so that she skips over them Maybe get out an exacto knife and just kind of do a little bit of trimming before you hand her over her your first. I copy. love uh, that, Michael. Okay, <laughs> that's what's going to happen from now on. So, how do you conceive of your reading audience then, and especially as someone who has this skill of being able to straddle both adult fiction 
and fiction that's ostensibly meant for young adults, but still gets embraced by adults? Um, you know, I do write, you know, sort of what's considered YA and then more literary or commercial fiction. And one of the things that I, I always think about when I'm deciding, uh, you know, who the audience is going to be is not necessarily the age of, you know, the protagonists or the characters. It's about what kind of a story I want to tell and and where I wanted to hit. With something like The Marrow Thieves, I knew, um, you know, Early on, uh, when the conversation came up, the idea that this book could somehow be read by uh, young people, I thought was incredibly important because I certainly wrote it first and foremost for uh, Indigenous young people. Um, and then I thought, you know, it was mentioned, well, maybe maybe a school would pick it up. And I thought, oh, my God, imagine this story um, in schools. And I mean, we know, as it turns out, um, the, the book is now taught in Canadian schools and, and American schools um, nationally, which is great. And I think there's, you know, such an important conversation to be had. But really, I, when I think about it, the difference in writing and where I change between audiences is when it's for young people, um, it's, I, I imagine that it's like running down a hill, right? Like eyes closed, arms windmilling, like chest open, full emotion, right? It's the best day or it's the worst day. And these emotions are big. And I, and I love that. It's, it's not even, um, you know, that I think it's ridiculous that the, the emotions are that big. Like, of course, it's not the worst day. Don't, trust me, you'll get a job that things will get worse. But, but it's honoring that space, that it's such a time of change. And, and that, you know, these young people need to have those big emotions. And it's such a beautiful thing. So I don't dumb down sort of, you know, the language, I don't uh -huh. make things simple. If anything, I think young people can grasp so much, you know, the darkness. I mean, my God, look at the world we're leaving them. You know, they're into it. They're like, give me the apocalypse. I need to know how to survive because it's coming. Thank you very much. Um, but it really is about like heart first um, to try and reach them where they are. And then, you know, in, in terms of uh, other work, I know, first of all, that, you know, young people, of course, are reading those novels. Um, and it, it is really that is really the only difference. I'll say that. Uh -huh. Honestly, I just I think young people are so brilliant. They make the most inquisitive readers. Um, I try really hard to be specific uh, uh, you know, with my points of view and, and to make sure that there's enough of a seed there for them to go off and find more answers, uh, you know, if, as needed, um, you know, and, and that's it. It's just spinning a good story. Books are becoming just one means of expression for you. You're also starting to work on stage. You're starting to work in television. Tell me just a little bit about what that process is like when you leave one medium that you're really comfortable in and start to stretch it and push it. Yeah, it's uh, it's terrifying. It's uh, and exhilarating, right? It's amazing. You know, I said it's it's good when you're when you're you're in a place of safety to be to be a bit terrified now and then. It's um, that's it. I I like being uh, shaken up. It's um, I mean, here's the thing. I I I love uh consuming beautiful horrific content right i mean we all do it's great movies good tv um um incredible graphic novels comic books you know the opera it, theater everything it's it's so inspiring and i i'm so in awe of these creators um and i think really i i i wanted to find different ways to to communicate uh story because it's so interesting to me that there's so many prolific, incredible creators out there. Um, I, I did have Lee Miracle once uh, asked me to, to try poetry. She said, your prose is very poetic. You should try poetry. Um, and so I said, oh, my God, I could be a poet. Poets are so fancy. So I, I went home and I, I wrote a poem and I brought it back to her. And she said, I'm OK, so never write poetry again. <laughs> oh <my laughs> I was like... I know. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so we'll just cross that off the list. So this, I will never be a fancy poet, but uh, but I love poetry and I have lots of poet friends and I'm very envious. Um, but uh, I, it was interesting for me. I kind of fell into screenwriting. Um, um, you know, at one point I was I was working on, uh, uh, you know, breaking out the, the Marrow Thieves 
uh, with Jenica Harper, who, you know, does the Jan Arden show and is just an incredible screenwriter. And she took, she gave me this incredible gift. And, and the gift was her time and her patience. So where she could have just uh, given me very specific kind of marching orders on what is what the script should be. She sat down and explained to me how to take something from the page, from prose, and put it into a screenplay. Um, and so I kind of fell in love with it. It was it was like putting a puzzle together, and I I love that. It's why I I you know in my early years worked at magazines because it really is about putting this complex, beautiful puzzle together. Um, and so then I got a call um, later, uh, Britt Marling from uh, the OA had read Empire of Wild and really loved it. And so she invited me into a, a room for a show that she was doing with all of these, you know, brilliant writers um, and really just, you know, brainstorming out loud. And that was really shocking for me at first because I was used to like, you know, being quite <laughs> frankly, you know, in my pajamas in my office you know, sharing ideas with like my wiener dog who really had no input. Um, like, what do you mean we have to all sit together and like talk to each other? <laughs> this is something I should be doing by myself. Exactly, exactly. And so, and so what it really did was um, stripped the ego out of it. And I always thought like ego, I'm a writer. Like we're not like, you know, this isn't the fifties where we were like rock stars. We're just like, I mean, some people are rock stars, like David Cherry Andy's a rock star, but you could totally be a rock star. Come on. Yes. Michael, you're in my coven now. Um, but it was, it was, but it truly was. I didn't realize there, of course, of course you, I had an ego about my writing. We all do as, as in anything we do. Otherwise, you know, how are we, how are we having the confidence to move forward? So it really was the space where I had to let go uh, and, and allow it to fully be about the story. Um, so the, the last uh, project that I worked on, I was um, in LA last year working on in a, in a brilliant writer's room for the um, Stephen King prequel to, to it. Um, so that was interesting, having grown up with Stephen King's work, uh, uh, of course, as all of us glorious, messed up 70s kids were, um, and then adapting his work uh, for, for the screen was really remarkable. Um, and so I, I love that medium. I love actually sitting down with other writers who are just as nerdy and awkward as me um, and just really giving it everything we have on behalf of the story uh, in and of itself for no other reason than that story. So um, yeah, I do. I love it. Cherie, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a delight. Thank you so much. This was entirely too much fun. <laughs> I have been speaking with Cherie Demolai. Her new book is Venco. Get it by clicking on the link in our show notes or visit us at kobo.com slash conversation. We hope you've subscribed. And if not, maybe take a second to do that so you don't miss another episode. Kobo Conversation is produced by Nathan Maharaj and hosted by me, Michael Tamblin. Thank you for listening.